there he is. You so want to sit on here? I can get your over if you like. No, I can sit here. Stay there, Joy. Joy? No, 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 I'm sitting here. I have more chairs. You want to sit over there? There's a chair here, too. I don't want to sit Would you rather sit in a chair or would it be more comfortable for you? Probably. <laughs> Well, good morning. good morning. It's nice to see you. I look forward to getting to know you. I am Brian Holman. I am the pastor at Kirkville Community Church, not too far away. And for uh, many years, we've had a study that was on Thursdays at 1 o'clock. And we decided to come over and join you. And uh, so some of my folks from my church and my study are here. Uh, uh, Pam and Peter, they live here, yeah. and they attend our church. And so I thought we'd just go quickly around the room and introduce one another. Uh, I'm Brian Holman, and you're Carrie. I'm Carrie Smith. Okay. I'm Bonnie McClellan. I'm Pam Mackey. Peter Mackey. Susan Trillwicking. Lillian Oswald. Genevieve Smith. <coughs> Patricia Conklin. Jamie Rydland. Ann Miller. Peggy <laughs> Klein. Marie Joy Gillis. Priscilla Suits. Priscilla? Is that it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Jane Lynn Dacker. Barbara Wheaton. Carol Huff. Oh, Sharon Starr. Very good. So it's nice to know you. It would take a while for me to get to know your names. Here's somebody else that just came in. Oh, hi. Matt. Yes, we did. Hey. Maureen. <laughs> Maureen O'Hara. <laughs> oh, Brady, I'm oh, sorry. You're close. Close. Still yeah. Irish. <laughs> well, I didn't know quite what you were doing, but what I'd like to try to do is, uh, since we've entered into the Advent season, mm -hmm. the Advent season, of course, is the four weeks that uh, lead up for Christmas. And so we want to focus upon our preparations for the celebration of Christ's birth. I should also warn you that you are being broadcast. So, all right. So, so make sure you you, you have clean language. <laughs> Hear that, Peter? No. Yeah, that's for Peter's benefit. <laughs> so, what we're going to be doing is that I know that there is the traditional story of that we have of Christ's birth. Some people have asked me. There's a word that we have. It's called incarnation. And so people were wondering, have asked me before, because uh, I have some persons that are new to the faith, and they aren't familiar with some of those terms. And so I wanted to take some time to be able to explore um, how we come up with the understanding of what incarnation is. And that's going to focus more upon some of the letters of Paul uh, that he wrote, because he'll mention the birth of Christ in different ways. So we're going to look at how the birth of Christ fits in with the gospel uh, and how it came to be. So that's what I thought we'd kind of do. And to begin, I thought what we do is sing. If you're around me, we sing. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all the so, time. All the time. So I did have a song, <laughs> some song sheets for you here, uh, just with some songs. And uh, we'll add some familiar Christmas ones as the weeks go by. But the first one is O come, O come, Emmanuel. Okay? Goes this way. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God in its ways to 
Crouching our tribes and side by side In ancient times did give the law In cloud and majesty and awe Rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to Come, O branch of Jesse's stem, unto your own and rest you them. From depths of hell your people say, and give them victory over the grave. Rejoice! Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. We'll stop right there, even though there's three more verses. You'll notice that there's seven verses. There's seven verses because it's a holy number. Seven is a holy number, as is three a holy number. So this was composed in a, in a way to, to emphasize the completeness or perfection of God. Seven is the word for perfection. Mm -hmm. And within each of these, it tells a little bit about uh, the coming of the Messiah. Um, and so some people, one person asked me, well, why does it say Emmanuel? And then and it also says Emmanuel. Which is it? Well, the word of God was translated uh, from Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic. Um, and so what happens is the uh, Emmanuel is the Greek translation. And Emmanuel would be coming from the Hebrew. So either way, it means the same thing when things are translated. What's interesting about this is it's anticipating the coming of Christ, of the anointed one, which we recognize as being Jesus. And so it talks about God from the beginning, uh, the, the Son of God appears, and he was there with God, the wisdom from on high. So from creation, so then we find this professing that the Son of God was always with God from the very beginning. Even before Abraham, well, after Abraham with, with uh, uh, Moses. Moses, God gave the law through Moses. And even there, it says, great Lord of might, who to your tribes on Sinai's height. That's where the law was given. Then we have also a uh, branch of Jesse's stem that comes from Isaiah 11. And so you can look those references up. Um, and then also Key and David, because the anointed one, the Messiah, was to come in the lineage of David. So each of those verses have a connection in the Old Testament to anticipating the coming, the coming of Jesus, whom we recognize as the Messiah. Here's a one I don't know if you've ever heard before. All the earth is waiting. We're going to be seeing this on the, on the third Sunday at our church. Um, uh, we're going to be seeing this because it's it's very much a Hispanic. And we have uh, some fa a family from Panama, and we're going to be doing a Christmas in a Hispanic tradition with a thing called Las Posadas. And the Las Posadas is uh, what happens is it focuses upon Mary and Joseph going door to door and knocking on the door and being turned away. And so, do you have any room for Jesus? That's the important stuff. But this is also a Hispanic um, hymn. And so it goes this way. All the earth is waiting to see the promise God. And open the furrows, awake the seed of God. All the world bound and struggling seeks true liberty. 
cries out for justice and searches for the truth. Thus says the prophet to those of Israel, O virgin mother, O very man you were, one whose name is God with us, our Savior shall be. With him hope will blossom once more within our hearts. Mountains and valleys will have to be made plain. Open new highways, new highways for the Lord. He is now coming closer, so come all and see. And open the doorways as wide as wide can be. In a lowly stable, the promised one appeared. Yet feel his presence throughout the earth today. For he lives in all Christians and is with us now. Again with his coming, he brings us liberty. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have heard the word incarnation before? Most people have. What does it mean to you? When you hear the word incarnation, what does that mean to you? To be brought about life. To be brought about life. Okay, very good. Yes. In the flesh. In the flesh. Yes, very good. Because carnate, uh, we get the word carnal, which is not good. We're not supposed to be carnal. That's being in the flesh, flesh and blood. And so what we have is incarnate. It means that Jesus became, or God became flesh. Very simple. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, I don't know if I made enough copies, but if you could share, I did make a copy of the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is a very important creed. Because the creed, it came about in, in 325 A.D. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. And what happened is that uh, Christianity was not legal until 310, when Emperor Constantine became supposedly became a Christian, and so he legalized Christianity. And so the churches had been persecuted on and off, and they met in different communities and such, but then all of a sudden, they said, now we can meet freely and openly. So they all of a sudden, all these different churches, whether from Corinth, Galatia, Ephesus, whatever, they sent leaders to meet together in a place called Nicaea. And because they needed to say, what is it that we believe together as a church? They each had their own portions of, of letters that Paul or Luke or whatever would write to them. They didn't have a full, what we call the canon yet. They would develop that too. That means the Bible that we have. And so what they did is they had to address some things that were false. And one of the false things that were being taught, uh, as the people were struggling with, is who is Jesus? Who is he? Was he a prophet? Was he an angel? Because what the Old Testament always believed, that you couldn't see God because God was too perfect. So what they did is that God sent angels who delivered the law, who delivered the word. And so they wondered, well, maybe he was the best angel. And there's this strange creature in the Old Testament called the angel of the Lord. <clears throat> and we don't really know who exactly he is. Well, I think I know who he is, and you probably need to do too. But so because of that struggle, they needed to know and come up with, this is what we as Christians believe who Jesus is. So I'd ask us to read this together and think about what it says. It may be a little foggy, um, but uh, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Lord of Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. To focus on those phrases that are very particular to make sure that we realize that the Son was begotten of God, not made. You and I have been made. But the Son was begotten. So because they saw within Jesus that the very personality and character of God resided within Jesus. Now that's a hard thing to understand. The Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. There are passages that address the Trinity that God is, appears to us in Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But there's no saying, well, God is a Trinity. You know, that came up by the church trying to understand the relationship between God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so it is a mystery. No one can fully explain it. I've had to with children when we try different things from ice and water and it also becomes a gas or to, uh, uh, to also an egg that has a shell and it has you know, the white part and the yolk. You know, uh, the best explanation of the Trinity that I have ever found is comparing the Trinity to us. We have a physical body. We also have a soul. We have a personality that's unique to each one of us. But there's also the yolk, the spirit. And that spirit was given to us, breathed into us by God, so that we might have a hunger and search for God. That's the best way I've been able to explain the Trinity. It's still a mystery. We cannot really explain it. And, and that's what we have to believe by faith. And, uh, you know, Jesus called God his Father. So we call God his Father. But God, we also, Paul tells us, is not male. God is a spirit. But we come to know God personally uh, is not just some spooky thing out there. Through understanding that Jesus referred to him as his Father. And so, and then the Spirit is that which through the Father and the Son is given to each of us. If we have faith in Christ, God has promised that he would give to us, Jesus has promised, his Spirit who resides in us. So God is no longer far off. God is right here. And right here. Because if God is within each of us, whenever we relate to one another, share one another's lives and hopes and dreams, we actually touch the heart of God. I hope that means something to you. We're going to be looking at two passages. One's going to be from Matthew. The other is from Luke. So I printed some off to you. And these are going to be... Uh, uh, recognized by you very easily. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. 
Thank you, Peggy. You must have been a teacher. <laughs> You're a helper. Very good. You can read it in your Bibles if you like. Or I have did print some off. Now, if you would, I would ask, I'm going to ask Tammy to read it out loud. She'll read Matthew 1, 18 through 25 for us. And this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what she has conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name of Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said throughout the, through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do and took Mary as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him his name, Jesus. So that story is really familiar to you, uh, I'm sure. But are there any questions that you have in that passage of Scripture that you would like to lift up? Or think observations that you, that you have? I know oftentimes one that is asked of me is that, wait a second, he was engaged to Mary. So how could he divorce her? Since they weren't married yet. In Hebrew culture, and, and different, all different cultures have different, marriage is a common um, element of culture. Uh, but in the Hebrew culture, uh, it developed that they would have, uh, a marriage would begin with an engagement. You were committed when you were engaged. But what was to happen in those days, uh, it was also arrangements for marriages were made by parents. You might know the person. You might have attended uh, synagogue school with them. You uh, knew them. But you didn't necessarily knew them really well. You didn't have a dating system like what we have developed in the United States and other countries. You, uh, you involved each other with each other socially as a community. And then your parents would observe, and they would talk to their children. It wasn't a matter of saying, well, we're going to put this person over here. You know, uh, they'd check with their daughter or their son to find out, you know, who you might be interested in. And they would then make an arrangement. And there'd be a dowry and whatever. But they were considered legally to be husband and wife from the minute of that engagement. But they were not to live together for about a year. What was to happen is that she was to visit his family, if he had family, and get to know him more intimately through his family. And then uh, he was to be going off to build a home for he and his wife because uh, he would be living within his family's home, even if he was in his 20s. Is believed that Joseph was older. He was already a carpenter. So maybe he was an old man of maybe 20 or 21. Okay? Because that was old in those days. Okay? And of course, we have probably heard that Mary was most likely a, a young late girl of 13. She would have gone through her bar mitzvah 
where she became a woman. And I've been to bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs. Oh, it may not be a bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvahs for a boy, bat mitzvah for a girl. So she would have become legal age. She would have had to be about 13 years of age. And that meant that she could be hooked up, okay? And so uh, they were engaged. And she was a young girl, according to our estimation. But the marriage started then, okay? But while they were the, in the engagement process, she was found to be with child. Now, several things would have been uh, thought of in the community uh, at that time. It says, well, they couldn't, they couldn't contain themselves, okay? So as they would lose their respectability because they decided to hook up before the ceremony. And uh, that would have been one thing. Um, some authors have thought that uh, as soon as Mary found out that she was expecting, she ran off to see Elizabeth. Okay. And by seeing Elizabeth, that confirmed her pregnancy. Okay. Because what did, what did Elizabeth say to Mary? Why is the mother of my Lord? <laughs> she already knew. And that confirmed. So as we look into Mary, Mary might have had some doubts. And as soon as the angel had told her, and we're going to sing about that a little bit here, uh, that she was going to be giving birth to God's child, that she, that uh, one of the evidences the angel gave was that, and your cousin Elizabeth in her old age. Terrible, being 40 that, years old and being that, pregnant. But that's why Elizabeth was so sure mm -hmm. that God had spoken to her because she was older, had never, she'd always been barren, yep. and now she's going to have a long, That's right. child. So actually Elizabeth had more assurance that yeah. it was God doing something within her right. uh, than Mary did. And so she went off to, to Elizabeth. She spent five months with Elizabeth. Now, the, the women here know what happens in five months of pregnancy. Um, so <laughs> the question lies that someone has asked me, did she tell Joseph before or after she came back from Elizabeth? Hmm. What did Joseph told to name him Jesus? Yes. The father had the, had the power in that culture to be able to give so, the name. Now, when, when did he do, when was he told that? Uh, in, in his, during, uh, during the uh, pregnancy? Yes. Mm -hmm. But we don't know when. Mm -hmm. Actually it shows that and, and he gave him the name Jesus. We find that, that Mary was actually told that he was to be named Jesus. So this for, for you men, um, we should listen to our wives because she would be the one to tell him that he was to be, that he was to be named Jesus. Now, see, I'm confused. Okay. Okay, which is unusual. <laughs> um, is he considered an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream? Yes. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Yeah. So he was told. He was yeah, told what the name but, but he was told that she was going to have a baby. Yeah. So yep. he yep. knew it by the time yep. she came back from Elizabeth. He already knew. So it's a question of whether she told him, I'm, I'm expecting, before she went off to see Elizabeth or whether it was after she returned. And it was quite obvious. But well, when did he have the strength? So after he realized <laughs> that uh, Mary was expecting, then he struggled with what am I, what am I, what am I going to do? Uh, could she have encountered someone on her trip to Elizabeth? Uh, some uh, scholars believe that, uh, who are skeptics of who Jesus is, would say that he, she was probably raped by a Roman soldier as she traveled and she went you know, to uh, another location where Hebron, where, um, where Elizabeth and Zechariah lived. So they'd have different 
understandings without really asking. And Mary would say, you know, an angel came to me. And so I, I was told I had to bear God's son. And of course, being young as she was, there are others so in the community who would have said... So young and so innocent. It was probably good she went to Elizabeth because Elizabeth probably taught her a, very, a lot of things mm -hmm. in those five months. She was, I mm -hmm. think, very innocent of everything. Mm -hmm. If she's yeah, so so the basically tradition has it is that after she was told, of course she was told that her cousin Elizabeth was expected. She then went off um, to see Elizabeth. She did so not just because she cared about Elizabeth. Um, she did that because she had some doubts. You know, how many of us would have had a, an angel come to us and appear to us and say, hey, uh, you don't you don't have a husband yet uh, and you're going to be pregnant uh, you know it's kind of a hard news for a 13 year old to have except why did he choose such a young girl well that's it that's, let's get some other opinions why do you think that God would choose such a young girl she was young and pure, pure. she was pure she was not yet married so she you know you couldn't say it was a husband's child like John's, uh, John who was born was the son, not of God, but the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Okay. It was common in that culture to marry young age. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. And purity was very important. Well, health was better the younger you were, too, I think, in those days. They didn't live very long. And <coughs> High mortality better. rate was, was experienced then. Um, you know, so that's, that's very, very true. Yes? What was the longevity at that time? What's the expected life? Well, I, from what I've read, it was in your mid-40s. If you were old, if you got into your 50s. And the reason for that was the harshness of life. There were other times in which the longevity would have been greater, but they were occupied by the Romans. They had uh, a harsh life. There was poverty. Uh, there was, you know, um, uh, lack of food. They struggled for food and such. It was not necessarily a pleasant environment. So we know that as you have harshness of an environment, your longevity, you know, uh, is shortened. Is there a tradition of Bas Mitzvah or Bas Mitzvah? I think in the case it was, I think, 13 or 14 at that time. Yes. Right? So yes. that was, if you were 14, you were considered to be an adult. Yes. Because of the, of the bat Mitzvah, she would have been an adult. He was already an adult, being about 20, 21, so they believed. But that's considered older. If she had gotten to be 18 and was not married, well, there'll be other rumors going around, okay? Um, old spinster, you know, 18. That's just so different from our understanding of the world, you know? But that's where they were. Uh, so um, I believe, as most scholars do, that Joseph had his dream after Mary returned from Elizabeth, and it was quite evident that she was bearing a child, and he knew it was not his. The community might have thought, well, before she went off, or they might have thought that she had an encounter when she was away. Um, so would they have scorned her? Yes. And they would have brought stigma upon Joseph. Uh, so he had the opportunity uh, of expressing what he believed happened by being able to say, I'm going to divorce her privately. And she would then stay with her mom and dad. Uh, some people say, well, in the Old Testament, if you were thought to be an adulterer, they would stone you. Uh, there's not, that's true, that's in the law, but uh, there's not too many occasions where there were stoning to death. Uh, we didn't find such stoning to death until we see that they tried to stone Paul, <laughs> the apostle Paul. He was beaten and stoned many times, but he didn't die. Um, so um, he prayed and in a dream. Now, this is a fantastic thing. Is 
How many of you have, I, I have dreams. Um, I don't believe most of my dreams. Do you? I can't remember. Uh, I think a lot of my dreams, I'm glad I don't remember. And uh, to all of a sudden dream, an angel came to you. Now how is that different from Mary and her encounter? Did Mary have a dream or did he appear to her when she was awake? Let's go to that. I'm going to have you sing again. See, our next passage, Luke 1, 26 through 38, is also in a hymn. We sang it this last Sunday. Luke 1? Yes. And it's on your song sheet. It's to a maid engaged to Joseph. To a maid engaged to Joseph. The angel Gabriel came. Fear not, the angel told her, I come to bring good news. Good news I come to tell you. Good news I say, good news. For you are highly favored. By the God, the Lord of all, who even now is with you. You are on earth most blessed. You are most blessed, most blessed. God chose you, you are blessed. But Mary was most troubled to hear the angels word. What was the angel saying? It troubled her to hear, to hear the angel's message. It troubled her to hear. Fear not, for God is with you, and you shall bear a child. His name shall be called Jesus, God's offspring from on high. And he shall reign forever, forever reign on high. How shall this be, said Mary, I am not yet a wife. The angel answered quickly, The power of the Most High will come upon you shortly. The child will be God's child. As Mary heard the angel, she wondered at his words. Behold, I am your handmaid, she said unto her God. So be it, I am ready, according to your word. That's basically the passage from Luke. And you see there that Mary was informed that he would be called Jesus. And because the Annunciation came to Mary first. That's why we believe that when all of a sudden, uh, when Joseph realized and she told him uh, that Sarah was expecting, she would also have included in her story that the angel Gabriel had told her that he was to be, ma be named Jesus, which means God saves. God saves. That's what the name Jesus means. And so, he would have, in his dream, we have to ask, was this a dream? Was this really an angel? Or was he dreaming, remembering that Mary had told him that the child was to be named Jesus? Isn't that something? Um, you know, that's quite amazing. It also shows to me, my belief, anyways, uh, in Joseph's decision to say, no, I'm going to take you as my wife. I think that Joseph truly loved Mary. It was part of his, you know, we have to ask ourselves sometimes in our faith, 
is this really God speaking yeah. to me? Sometimes we put up a big list or is this something that comes from within you? But maybe it's the both. Can God not speak through our heart? Does it have to be a, a physical, visible angel? Can God not speak through his spirit into our heart? And so that somehow Joseph, as he wrestled and struggled with himself, what should I do? I love this young girl. I want her to be my wife. And so I'm going to believe her. That took an act of faith for him to believe her. And so was his dream a figment of his own imagination? Or was it really a visitation in a dream by an angel? Go ahead. I think the fact that he abstained from knowing her until mm -hmm. after the birth of Jesus mm -hmm. indicates that he did believe mm -hmm. what the angel told him. I believe he did too. Very strong. We oftentimes center our thoughts around Mary. It's not just because I'm a man that I want to lift up Joseph. But there's more here in both of them. Why God chose both Mary and Joseph? I'm, I'm amazed. I can't believe that Mary just said to me, oh, yeah, okay, I'm ready. I mean, you know, she's, what, 13, 14 years old? I'd be scared beyond anything, I would think. Well, there's two things that are important from that. The first one is God will never do something. Yes, go ahead. Oh, no, keep speaking. Oh, no, go ahead. Because she said... I am your enemy. Yes. This had to do with a good upbringing. Yes. Her belief in God. Yes. And so she accepted this. Yes. And you know, many times for us, mm -hmm. um, some important things. First of all, God will not do anything with us without our permission. Why don't you think about that for a bit? God will not do anything with us without our permission. When we pray to God, we are opening ourselves and giving God permission to work within our lives. Right? For those that come to faith, some people have probably been raised to faith. Uh, I know I had some conversion moments, several different conversion moments in my growing up, in, in my early adult life. Probably you'll have some more. I don't know. But... There's some people, they have one dramatic experience where they came from a place of unbelief to belief. Okay? But you know, why is it that we have to say, God, I confess my sins. Forgive my sins. And, you know, rep I repent of my sins. I come and dwell with me. We have to ask. God will not come into us and into our lives without our invitation. So Mary, God was not going to force on Mary his will. But God also knew Mary so well. He knew, as you said, he, she had that heart. That Okay, I don't understand this. I don't think that Mary understood this at all. But, okay, I'll accept it. Whatever your will for me is. Now, that also help comes to us, too. Parents. Go ahead. I mean, today, I, in the 50s, when I was growing up, the worst thing you could do oh, yes. is be pregnant and not marry. And <coughs> the worst people you want to see are your parents, who would be, you know, usually very angry. Mm -hmm. So, there's no mention of the family no, or no, anything. No. It comes silent. Yeah. Yeah. And Mary didn't mention because, uh, go ahead, did you have something? Oh, it's just an ar arbitrary question about, um, like in the Old Testament it says, um, he shall be called Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. God with us. Right, but then they tell him to call him Jesus. Yes, God saves. They're two different words. <laughs> that's actually a very good question. While that's that's different, what it is is that God is the only one in the Old Testament that can save. Right. And so if if God saves and this this child is called Jesus, 
God saves. That means God is saving us. God is within him because only God can save. Why did they call him Emmanuel? Good question. I do not know that answer. I really don't. Um, except for the fact that, like I said, only God can save. And so naming him Jesus uh, is God saves. Also, I, Jesus was not necessarily an unfamiliar name. I had someone working at, some contractors working at my house. And, uh, and all of a sudden, one of the head uh, contractors all of a sudden shouted down the stairs, Hey, Jesus! Okay? And all of a sudden, someone from my bathroom cried out, Yeah! <laughs> because the workman was named Jesus. Baseball players. Yeah. Yes, Jesus. And, and so it made me laugh, kind of shocked me a bit. But it was not an unfamiliar name. I'm not sure it was an unfamiliar name then. It was an unfamiliar name in that, uh, well, familiar name, in that people were so desperate. They had gone 500 years without a prophet. They had gone 500 years in silence without hearing a word from God. And all they saw themselves as being conquered by the Greeks and conquered by the Romans, uh, having a puppet king, a uh, Jewish king on the throne, and they in poverty and um, in want, and wandering and crying out, Oh God, where are you? And hearing of the passages from Isaiah, which were beyond those 500 years, well, God sent someone to save us. And so with each child, sometimes when they name him Jesus, is probably almost a hope, a longing. You know? Will and God come and save us? And aren't there many names that mean basically the same thing? There are. Mm -hmm. There are. But that's a very good question. I think it's like a, um, not really a title, but, um, you know, like, uh, you are Pastor mm -hmm. Brian. Right. Okay. He's Emmanuel Jesus. He's That's Jesus, true. You know, uh, and Emmanuel in his name is Jesus. Now, that, what you bring up is a very good point. Because what happens, we're talking about what is incarnation. Mm -hmm. And incarnation is that we believe that God became human yes. flesh. That's a foreign idea. So the Jews had Emmanuel, God with us. And then all of a sudden, this young boy is called God saves. And the only reason, way for, for the apostles, when they started writing these letters, even these are letters, okay, uh, was to, to say that uh, how uh, the, we could be saved by Jesus on the cross, dying on the cross, was because he is Emmanuel, God with us. They don't mention Emmanuel in the New Testament, though, do they? They don't mention it, Emmanuel in the New Testament. They, that's what we're going to be looking at in future weeks here, is how the apostles began to understand the relationship of Jesus to be our Savior. Okay. The first, the church was birthed around the resurrection. I mean, what, do you, what can you say? Here's a person that died. No one comes back to life. Okay, this person comes back to life for 40, 40 days and, you know, he walks among us and, and we've seen him and we hear him and we saw him eat and drink. And, you know, so the first church was born out of the resurrection. But then as successive generations come, then all of a sudden there's the question, well, how do we understand Jesus? Hey, what do you say? He taught, uh, I and my father are one. What does that mean? So what happens is they began to go and look at his birth became more important. So when Luke wrote the story from Mary's perspective, Luke is, was a doctor. Okay? You know how babies were born. And so he then went back and researched, if you look in, in Acts and also Luke, he went back and he got the story from Mary. So Mary didn't mention her parents. Maybe because she didn't feel too good about them because the way they didn't support her in what she had shared, you know. She was on her own. And she was on her own with Joseph. An angel didn't speak to them as well. I don't know. 
Genesis, he was there too. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That becomes comes part of our understanding of the Trinity, is that the um, not Jesus, Jesus, but the second person of the Trinity, Christ, son, the son, of God. son of God, was there with God from the beginning. Yeah, he was there. And then he became creation. a physical entity with the birth before of Jesus. the God created the world. He yes. Was there. Yes. He was. And we get that particularly through the Gospel of John, because John doesn't have a story of G Jesus and Mary and Joseph. He starts out, in the beginning was God. Okay? Was the Word. The Word was God. You know, and, and that comes from Genesis. God started creating with the Word. And we came to understand Jesus as the Word. And the, the reason why the expressions change is because of when these were written. We have to understand that the um, that most likely the first um, Paul's letters came first, and intermixed with that came the the Gospels. First became came the Gospel of Matthew, which was written to explain who Jesus is uh, to Jews, and Luke who, uh, came later, maybe AD sixty six, and he was a, a Gentile. And so he was writing to Theophilus, so a Gentile, to explain, I want to explain to you from the beginning. And if you, I think it says that right in the beginning of Luke. Turn to there. Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write a careful account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so that you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So Luke, as a physician, as a researcher, he went back to the original sources as much as he could. It is believed that one of those original sources was Mary herself, because Mary was still alive. And Mary was taken by, after Jesus' Jesus's crucifixion, he gave John, okay, responsibility for caring of, mm -hmm. of Mary, not his brothers. His brothers didn't believe him. And they t went to, he took her to Ephesus. There's a church there. And there's a church in Ephesus yeah. uh, dedicated to Mary. And it's believed that that's where she lived with John, and that's also where she died. So Luke went and got the, uh, this portion directly from the horse's mouth, if you want to call it, okay? which I think is fascinating, really fascinating. But I want you to, to recognize in both of these accounts, um, what was it that was said to Joseph? Do not be afraid, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. So the question that Mary had, well, how can this be, because I don't have... Uh -huh. okay. And the angel said, well, the God will come down upon you. Now, I don't know what she imagined that was going to be. I can't imagine that either. Okay. Um, but that's what was said to her. And then to Joseph, he said, she would be conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the incarnation that we have is how do we understand Jesus? He was fully human, but his spirit, you know, he didn't have a combination of Joseph and Mary in their DNA. It was Mary's DNA and God's spirit that so infused and spoke the word of creation within Mary that it was a miracle, that's all you can describe it, of the invisible God through spirit, entering Mary and giving birth. And I like to think about that a little bit because I believe that this God has sent his spirit to those who have faith in Christ. So what does that mean? Certainly not in the same degree that Jesus, you know, was God in human flesh. But God abides in us. So when we sit alone and we think and we pray and commune with God, uh, 
in formal or informal ways. Realize that we're not alone. God is with us. In the hospital bed, in the nursing home, whatever it is, we know we're not alone. Uh, we have the Spirit of Christ with us. So anyways, what we're going to be doing, is there any other questions that you might have regarding these two passages? There's so much in here, you can go on for a long, long time. I'm not going to do that. That way I can have other studies at other times and hit on things I didn't touch on. But uh, we'll be looking then at other passages, like from Galatians, Philippians, and Colossians, to see where the Apostle Paul and some other apostles described the Incarnation and how important that was to our salvation. Okay. Any questions? You sure? You can always interrupt me. I love it. And, and thank you for pointing out when I, my head is over here and you pointed out that she had a question here. So please. Do. You said that's being recorded, I assume, at your church. It is being recorded. It's being live broadcast right now over Facebook. And then what happens it is will be uploaded to YouTube. So people can go and find it. If Some people will not be part of our, dis, our Bible study because they are working. And so what they can do in the evening in their home, they can come and watch it. And sometimes I've had my phone here, um, and people have text in observations or questions. But oftentimes they come back, like there's a... Uh, African-American woman, Angelina Jenkins, and uh, she is handicapped, and she'll join us, but she says, I can't type fast enough. <laughs> so. so anybody that wants to tout show this broadcast to anybody now, you can go to Facebook to God's Word for Today, and it will be there. Mm -hmm. Is that what the title is? Yep, the, the Facebook page is called God's Word for Today. Hey, you see, because there's my ugly mug on it. So. Matter, so. No, we worked with it, wasn't that So, how about if we pray? Gracious God, we sang, which is a prayer. We didn't pray to you. As we sing these songs and as we read your word, we are brought to amazement of what you have done and question what might you do yet in these days, and possibly in our lives. We may feel that more of our life is before us than, than what is yet to come, but that's not true, because we bear your spirit and the message of hope and peace. Help us to be that helping smile, that reassuring presence for others and to be able to speak the words of hope to those who may be in darkness and despair. Thank you for what you revealed to us, and thank you for what you yet to have revealed to us. Every day is a new day. Every day is a new opportunity to live our lives with you. Thank you for being with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we ask who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I did it before that. Yeah, 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 no. I'm, I'm very blessed. Down by your feet is my height of it. Oh, <laughs> I wonder what that was that's touching my toes. <laughs> so thank you very much for joining with us. And I hope that uh, uh, this uh, instructed and inspired you, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Yes. I know that it says we believe in one holy apostolic church, but why are we at their capital? Catholic small C is universal. If it was capital C, it would be Roman Catholic Church. Small C.
I know. Yes. I, know. I, I, know. I, what, I used to do capital. <laughs> <laughs> I drew the number. So I land on the is a field before I to get the newspaper. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Well, I have a book that I wrote and published, and I'd be glad to bring a copy of it for you. Okay? Uh, what's happened is the, uh, uh, our church, Kirkville, was the United Methodist Church. We disaffiliated. Okay. And there's called No Other Church. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, so there are, in our old annual conference, of which we have 800 and, well, 840 churches, are Upper New York. You see, uh, uh, this is Upper New York, now it's like New York City. Uh, there are conferences about it themselves. But we've had uh, 160 uh, churches that this affiliated. Uh, and most of them have gone to a new denomination called Al United Methodist Church called the Global Methodist Church. And they have a website as well. Um, but there's, uh, as you go southward, uh, westward, you find that the Hispanic churches, about 20% of churches are New York State area. There's more of one or two that they didn't get through the first. All the cards One is theological. Um, yes, the theological affirmation of those who are disaffiliated is. Uh, Grounded in the fact that we feel the church was going away from church. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay? It was becoming too liberalized against our Oh, sure. And we support, and if for some reason you can't make it, uh, I'll our traditional stance on sexuality and all people are in the state. Uh, but we refuse to marry same sex. I, I, I believe in traditional family. You know, I'm taking that. Uh, I think there's one. Oh, yes. So that's the real crux of the land. Yes, I only want two hours. And so actually, if you go down south, we would go. Our work with some churches in Georgia. You want? There's about 400 churches. Well, you know, it, it's with you. It might be because you have to say to you, you don't live. Yeah. yeah. Our, our okay. And then you have the next day. So you're right. You're not that you need a lot. So you need more. Uh, and that's our mission. Our mission was here. 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 Yeah, stuff and it's worldwide. I mean, yeah. And um, yeah. Well, you know, the Presbyterians went through it. This family has been through it. We're the last church to go through it. Yeah. Oh, they're the first? Oh, okay. And we, uh, what we're doing is we chose a church community church right there to minister all the And we are suspicious of grandchildren are in school. So there's other churches that are independent too. I can't. No, you really If you're chatting, keep chatting. I don't know how this is set up either. I don't want to know. This is way of the setup. No, no. Oh, no, I get it. We have that. I can do chairs, but I can't set up one more. This one would go over there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very good. Hopefully, I explained that well enough for you. Yes. I'm going to leave. I'll be back. I'll be back. Hi. Here's the creed. And there is the messages we read today. Oh, very good. Okay, so you want these? I told you things. <laughs>
I don't have a voice. I don't either. Somebody, yeah. It's nice to listen yeah. to us. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there was the song. Yeah. Yes. 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 Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You're here. You gotta find, there's the first page. There's the second page. Like there we go. Yep. There they are. There's the songs. Thank you. Do you have any more? I this is nice stuff here. Oh, my God. I will get some more. Mine is like I got to take it in and clean it out. No, that's all right. I will Oh, oh, here's one. Oh, here's a nice and creed if you want that. I have the one with Matthew 20. So she needs a song. Let me see if I got one of those there. Matthew 118, Matthew 118. There's a come of come Emmanuel. Okay. I'm trying to see if there's a second page. I don't see the second page. So the book. <laughs> Yes, no, I didn't know it was going to be on a Monday, you know, fine. so. All right, very I good. Oh, right, already okay. scheduled. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. You probably want this table moved. Yeah. What are you doing now? Oh, tomorrow is our curriculum. Yes. Oh, right now. This minute? Yeah. Oops. So all that conversation was getting... <laughs> having, having all that, I don't want you to. all those That's people there.